Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hi, everybody. This is Joseph on this Jungian Life podcast, and I have a direct request. Would you just take a moment, if you're on YouTube, and click the subscribe button? And if you're on Apple Podcast, just click follow. Those two metrics help us enormously. It'll just take a second, and it would give us so much. Thank you. This morning, we are going to talk about energy, energy for life, psychic energy, physical energy, emotional energy, how that that is, regardless of who you are, where you are, what you do in the world, uh, how much energy does any of us have for life, for certain activities? Does it wax? Does it wane? Uh, What exactly are we talking about in terms of how we get into the world, what we bring to the world, um, and how we go about various activities um, in our daily life? What are all the factors that we need to consider uh, when somebody is maybe struggling with something of where's the energy, where to go, how do we find it again? So this is a really important topic, but before we get into it, I just want to remind you all about our Patreon. That's a way that you can support the podcast and you will get additional incredible benefits from us. I know a lot of people submit their dreams. They want us to interpret their dreams. You have a much better chance of hearing our interpretation of your dream if you become Mm -hmm. a patron at the $10 or $25 a month level. We do two $25 a month patron dreams every month. And I I think that pretty much guarantees that your dream will get interpreted, (laughs) if I'm not mistaken. So I hope that you will join us. You can go to our website, thisunionlife.com, click on podcast, and you'll see from the drop down Mm -hmm. menu, there's a a little thing that says become our patron. And that's how you can navigate over there. I can't resist mentioning that we're talking about energy. And this is an energy exchange. Yes. Uh, And so we appreciate and need your energy and support. Mm -hmm. And in return, uh, we do what we can to support you and attend to your dreams and your interests. Please Mm -hmm. come on board. So back to low energy. Mm -hmm. Mm. And, And I... I've been thinking, uh, when I was a body worker for many years, and then also now as an analyst, the issue of just vitality, the elan mm. vital of a person's body is something that's so substantive and mm-hmm. can be such a problem, whether it's a chronic fatigue syndrome or some other kind of metabolic concerns or Certainly in our current culture where some people are working 80 hours a week Uh, trying to donkey through a very high-powered corporate career. And then, of course, all of the emotional tensions that can sap our energy. But we seem to live in a world where more and more vitality is required. uh, And there are more and more challenges to rallying to that. It, it, I, I find it very curious. Yeah, that's interesting, Joseph, that you said we, we live in a world that requires more and more. And I think you're probably right about that, um, which explains this curious thing that I think we've all noticed is, you know, there's some people that just don't seem like they've got enough juice mm-hmm. 
to really make their way through their life in a successful way. And I think that's part of why we wanted to talk about this today, because it's not always obvious why that is. You meet, you meet someone, they may be very intelligent, uh, they may have all kinds of things going for them, but somehow they just can't get off the block. And is it, I have wondered, is it because of the way our society is structured, what our culture demands from us? You know, on the other hand, I also think it's like, well, I don't know that life was necessarily so easy, you know, if you were a, you know, subsistence farmer 100 years ago or 200 years ago, you know, that probably required a lot of life energy as well. But, uh, but, it, but it, it is curious to ponder, and there are many, many things, I think, in our life now that are just uh, really difficult, um, maybe not in a physical sense, but in, yeah. <laughs> I spent about two hours this weekend kind of like paying taxes and bills and figuring that kind of stuff out, and it, it was so taxing. <laughs> taxes are taxing. <laughs> yeah. Um, that I, uh, you know, I thought, whew, ha. Huh. That took a lot of energy. So there, there are many aspects of modern life that I think are, are really taxing in this particular way. I th modern life is very demanding uh, psychologically and emotionally. You know, I uh, wouldn't trade places with uh, a subsistence farmer from uh, times gone by, but at least one knows what one has to do. You take your hoe, you go to the field, and you know you work your way up and down the rows. Yeah. Uh, where, whereas today, there are a lot of functions are very, very demanding, very, very complicated, and it's not clear uh, at any given moment that anybody really knows how to do all the things that we're expected to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, of course, we have to... Uh, handle a multiplicity of things of right. taxes, bills, household, children, mm -hmm. uh, 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 maintenance of all kinds of appliances and cars, and, and uh, now the, the way that technology yeah, needs our attention. Yes, exactly. Uh, so so you paid our, for the streaming service, but it doesn't work. So it takes an hour to figure out what's wrong or whatever. You know? Right. Yes, exactly. Uh, so we're handling a multiplicity of needs, uh, demands, requirements, um, where I'm sure that in times gone by, uh, that kind of stimulation, demand, uh, w was not part of daily life. And I think it really saps energy. I think about all the stuff, I mean, people have coffee and other kinds of uh, stimulants to jack up our energy, uh, psychic energy and mental energy for what is basically now, for many people, a very sedentary lifestyle. So it's an odd juxtaposition of our physical selves and uh, our em emotional, intellectual, uh, uh, and job-oriented selves. Sit in front of a screen a lot. I think we're in that realm of r rapid change. I think prior to the Industrial Revolution, life didn't change very much, mm. and there was a psychophysical communication from the community to the children. So if dad was a blacksmith, the child uh, is around the life of the blacksmith, and there's a kind of physical transmission. Oh, that's how we stand. That's the rhythm. That's the mm -hmm. movement. That's the orientation. And in each iteration, perhaps something new is learned from the farmer, from the weaver, from the fisherman. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden with the Industrial Revolution, and my goodness, now everything is changing so quickly, so there isn't enough generational experimentation for us to inherit mm -hmm. any of the coping mechanisms that a previous generation might have experimented with. Yeah. What that means is it takes a lot of energy to invent a way to sustain oneself in an ever-changing mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. And most of us don't realize that we are trying to create mm -hmm. a way to sit for 10 hours a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trying to create a way to look 
at a weird little computer screen and yeah. pretend that there are living people <laughs> expressing <laughs> on the other side of it. Really. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, this, you know it, I, I, you've, what you've just said uh, reminds me of when uh, our kids were little and there was, you know, take your child to work day. Uh, so my my husband took our son to work, and um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it was sort of like, well, how'd it go? You know, what what was it like? And our, our son said, he doesn't do anything. He just <laughs> he just sits at a desk <laughs> and talks on the phone, yeah. or you know, or something something like that. But your point, Joseph, is so good that, you know, if you grew up in times gone by and your father was a blacksmith or a weaver or a farmer, uh, you would be taught. Mm -hmm. You knew exactly what it was. And we are now very much sort of divided from our inherent uh, nature that has evolved over millennia of us as physical beings. Uh, so, so wanting to sort of loop back into energy to life force, okay. I I wonder because I think that you know one of the reasons this topic is interesting is because of this phenomenon that sometimes in the United States we call failure to thrive, not the failure to thrive, failure to launch, but mm. it's um it is a real issue in for example in European countries now. I mean. I think the youth unemployment rate in Spain is uh, close to 50%. Oh, and, my. and there's high rates in uh, countries like Italy as well. Uh, and, you know, they're just, they're, they're, there aren't good jobs. The good jobs that there are are very hard to get. The, the kind of mediocre jobs you could get don't, don't pay very well and, and maybe are very taxing in terms of the time it takes to commute there or whatever. So there's a sense of kind of giving up hmm. and just resigning yourself to the oh well. And I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, kind of where our energy goes and how fear uh, or overwhelm, maybe is a better word, can, can really dampen our, our life energy because it just feels mm -hmm. too overwhelming to figure out how to do any of this. I'm I have uh, some young adults in my life, and I'm I'm just noticing the very understandable terror that they're all facing. But how do I figure out a life when I haven't mm -hmm. been brought up to see what a blacksmith does? And and in that sense, then the life energy can really turn on itself. You know, if you're a, a young, talented person with a certain urge to uh, uh, you know, to to do something in the world, but you you're too overwhelmed to figure mm -hmm. out how to do that. Then it becomes a corrosive inner process. Mm -hmm. If yeah, there's no there, there are, door to self actualize, yeah, there are too many moving parts. Uh, a, a lot of them are really not at all explicit. You can you can see what a weaver does. You can see what a blacksmith does. Uh, so uh, it's there's a, a vagueness and um, I think a difficulty accessing the external world. Uh, where where are the toeholds? Where's the foothold? Where do I begin? Um, what are the steps along this path? Uh, and so I'm just uh, teasing out the difference between what is one's internal life energy, motivation, desire, ambition, what have you, and where does that hook up with something in the external world that says, yes, come on in. Uh, here's where you start. Mm -hmm. well, Jung said something that I think is relevant to our conversation here. Um, and this is in the volume seven of the Collected Works. Libido can never be apprehended except in a definite form. That is to say, it is identical with fantasy images, hmm. and we can only release it from the grip of the unconscious by bringing up the corresponding fantasy images. So one of the things that I find really difficult mm. 
for young people is that there isn't room for them to acknowledge or identify their own fantasy images. Mm -hmm. It's as if um, a set of values has been uh, placed around their imaginations, which sounds like, you know, you, you need to be able to recoup the cost of your college expenses or, right. or whatever the rules are mm. that you're not permitted to fantasize or to allow the unconscious mm. to just talk to you mm -hmm. in terms of fantasies. And as soon as that process is alienated, mm -hmm. then we're kind of at sea without a, without a oars or without mm -hmm. an engine. Right. Because it's the fantasies that move us along. And of course, the fantasies can be metaphoric. They don't always have to be literal. Mm -hmm. You know, Joseph, I, I really um, I like a lot of what you said, and I want to pick up on embroider on it a little bit. First of all, you, you read the quote from Jung, and he mentions libido. And we should just say that when Jung uses the term libido, he's not talking about just sexual energy. So often in the mm -hmm. popular culture, libido means your sex drive. But the way Jung used it, it's just the available life force that you have for living. And it can be applied mm -hmm. in any number of ways, including towards sex, but toward life as well. And then, and then I, I just want to kind of second this notion about fantasy. And, and mm -hmm. it's interesting that Jung says that Fantasy essentially is kind of the channel or maybe the expression of life force. I love that um, because I think it's really true. And I, and I think it's true for young people. It's true for older people too. I have people that come in and I'll often say, well, what's your fantasy? You know, there's something they want. And I'll say, well, what's your fantasy? And some people can do that. You know, well, this mm -hmm. is what I fantasize about. But some people absolutely can't. They can't fantasize. Yeah. I love, I love what you said, Joseph, about you know fantasy being the way that the unconscious talks to you. And I have to say that I am really good at fantasizing, <laughs> but I can see that it's really served me well because I let myself have these kind of uh, like. <laughs> here's something that happened yesterday. All of a sudden, I went, "Oh my god." what would it be like to climb Mount Kilimanjaro? <laughs> I don't know why that occurred to me, but it just did. And it sort of lodged in my brain. And of course, I did a couple of Google searches, like how long does it take to climb Mount Kilimanjaro? And how much prep do you have to do? And, and it's just sort of living in there. And I, I, I asked my husband and he said, no, thank you, never. And, um, but then I'm like, okay, well maybe, like maybe my kids would do it with me. Like maybe I've got to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Nothing I've ever thought about before, but I'm just letting myself have a fantasy about it. Right. And that means that I let myself entertain it. I let myself have fun with it. I let myself, you know, do some internet searches about it, or maybe, you know, read an article or a book about it. Um, it doesn't mean I'm going to do it at all, but I allow myself to have the fantasy <sighs> Because who knows what might come of it. It might be that I wind up climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, or it could be that I um, just take up uh, hiking in a more serious way, you know, or, 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 or maybe nothing at all. Maybe it was just a really pleasant interlude. But it is, it is sort of, um, that is a really good example, I think, of sort of how energy moves through. I mean, I had this idea, and then throughout the rest of the day, I kept on coming back to it with this like little jolt of, you know, which is totally surprising. It did not come from the ego at all, but it was like my unconscious talking to me. So, well, I'm struck by so, just the vitality in your affect right yeah, now, yeah. and just how expressive. But I mean, literally, there's like yes. you know, 20 more volts of yes. energy, yeah, just yeah. moving. But, but really, you know, I'm also thinking about um, to expand fantasy to metaphor mm -hmm. of, you know, metaphorically speaking what kind of mountain might you want to climb? What other kind of task, what challenge is like climbing a mountain, um, which uh, I doubt you will actually literalize. Uh -huh. And that, you know, what we were talking about before is how externally oriented we are in today's world. Mm -hmm. And fantasy is internally oriented. Where's your imagination? Yes. Yes. Where, yes. where is the capacity for building images? And how do we get in touch uh, in this way with something that's alive inside, 
like climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Yeah. Of wow, wow, that how would that guide a person to selecting uh, a task, a career, a course of study, a project uh, in the external world? if it's not rooted somewhere in the internal world. Mm -hmm. And that's something that our culture does not value, doesn't mention, and doesn't really teach people how to do. But you know, um, God, Joseph. What I've come to really appreciate is that the Kilimanjaro <laughs> um, image <laughs> is just the beginning I'm regret of sharing a, that. Okay. a journey no, but really, it's the beginning of a journey inside of the psyche. There's uh, another quote from volume 16. I'll read it very quickly. We shall, by carefully analyzing every fascination, extract from it a portion of our own personality like a quintessence and slowly come to recognize that we meet ourselves time and again in a thousand disguises on the path of life. That's and what point. I'm interested in is the fascination part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So someone may come in and say, oh, I had this fantasy of um, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. And one of the disciplines I've um, mm -hmm. taken on in the office is, well, let's have that fantasy. Well, I mm -hmm. climb Kilimanjaro. I said, no, no, no. But tell me where it begins. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'll say, oh, well, I called a travel agent. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just keep asking, and then what happens? Uh -huh. And then what happens? Yeah, yeah. And what happens is after a few minutes, the conscious mind is kind of run out of the beginning of the fantasy. But when uh -huh. I encourage them nice. to keep, keep going, then the unconscious starts doing something all by itself. Yeah. And it will often lead someplace that I would not have expected that is often deeply emotional Mm -hmm. and cathartic and incredibly yeah. interesting and important. So it starts at Kilimanjaro or any number of other things. But mm -hmm. as the fantasy, as we examine the fascination, which is a young quote, it does go someplace unexpected. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's really great. Where there's great. a lot of libido. It's really great, right. So it's yeah. So being able to tune into fantasy images and hold them uh, I want to say the correct way, which is taking them seriously, but not literally, uh, mm. is, is a key to tapping into an, a vein of energy mm -hmm. um, in, in the psyche. You know, it's like this wants to go somewhere. And it, and it did. I mean, I, you know, I was having a perfectly lovely day yesterday, but when this idea occurred to me, I was like, whoop, I had a lot of energy. Um, so, uh, but I want I wanted to say further and kind of circling back to our topic about kind of low energy, the truth is we all know this, that being able to be in touch with your fantasies is uh, very important. But there right. are plenty of people who can have big fantasies and nothing ever happens. So again, there's something about where does that, where is that mm -hmm. low energy? Where is that low libido? What's that about? You know, the person who always says, you know, yeah, I'm gonna, you know, I don't know, X, Y, or Z. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move next next year. I'm looking at houses, and then like nothing ever happens. I've just got to get my house ready to put on the market, you know, but nothing ever happens. I'd really like to, you know, get a get a dog. I'm looking at different breeds, but mm -hmm. nothing ever happens. And it's not that. You know, as you were saying before, Deb, it's not like, you know, I can have this fantasy of climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and never do anything about it. It's not like we have to enact all of our fantasies. But there are those people who seem to be able to dream and fantasize, but who remain in a very stuck way and, uh, and have a very kind of constricted life who don't seem to be able to marshal that libido toward an mm -hmm. end goal in a, in a way that bears fruit. I think we're talking about the connection between the unconscious and the ego. Mm -hmm. And the people who say, well, you know, maybe I, I think I'm thinking about getting a dog or I'm thinking about moving to a different part of the country. Uh, I, I hear that as a sort of initial offering from ego 
mm-hmm. to the unconscious to say, hey, I'm reaching out. Um, I, I have this idea a- about a new project or about a relocation. Mm. Um, hey, unconscious, will you come forward here and meet me? Will you add some juice to this so that we have some momentum of for moving this idea in some direction. And it might not be the specific direction of I'm thinking about relocating uh, to the other coast. Well, maybe if something hooks in uh, deep within, in the interior, you know, that fantasy um, might sort of shift and move in a whole other direction, and I might wind up taking guitar lessons, for example. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but but there can be a divide between what consciousness is looking for and hoping for uh, that is not met by the unconscious, by something that has energy, that has that has eros, that has love, that has desire of a real a real want versus ego declaring um let's do something. Well, this puts me into Lisa's favorite place of no. the master and his emissary. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm amazed that I brought it up first because usually I'm the last person to that party. But it. Uh, I'm wondering. Where but you're it's going also with very this. well. It's very kabbalistic. That um, at a certain point uh, in the the psychophysical edge evolution of human beings, our ego woke up and discerned that it could make decisions, set intentionalities, that we had volition in a way that was not purely stimulated by that instinctive level of the body-mind, or not totally stimulated by the environment, so that the ego can kind of go off in its own little projects. <laughs> When we're in right alignment, or sometimes in our most potent alignment, that the right side of the brain generates a certain kind of creative image, a fantasy image, so to speak, or an instinctive excitation, it puts it over to that more egoic side, Mm -hmm. and in a sense asks the ego to find a way to actualize something, to use its ability to command resources to satisfy something that's been given to the waking personality from the deeper part of ourselves. So that seems to be more in the right order of things in terms of energy flowing from the deeper part mm. towards the ego. Yeah, so you're talking about even the though ego the ego self-access. can kind of just yes, just mm. do its own thing. Right. So I think that has to do with the idea of different parts of the brain itself, the ego self-access, and whether or not the ego is just kind of going along on its own mm. kind of party <laughs> without much of a connection either to instinct or to archetype. Yeah. And without the support of instinct archetype in the unconscious, it doesn't seem to have the same wellspring of mm-hmm. vitality. Um, to support itself. And I think it's true when we have someone come in who has this kind of low energy profile and the person may feel very stuck. You know, the person person may feel very stuck psycho spiritually, but also sometimes these people come in and they 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 don't have money, they're not able to really um mm-hmm. uh find a way to make a living or or they're living a very kind of marginal life. Um and uh and you do you kind of sit across from them and you think, where's the energy? And, and I do think in terms of the ego self axis and these sorts of people, I'm like, where's the self? When is the self going to constellate and kind of get this person out the door? Because sometimes, like I said, these people come in and you can see they're smart mm-hmm. and they're, you know, they have a kind of interior life mm-hmm. um, and, and they may have fantasies of what they want to do, but somehow it's like that connection is just missing. Um but I do, I do think there's something interesting here because we're we're sort of making this case, uh, which I think is true, 
that the energy ultimately comes from, let's say, the self or the unconscious, right? That that's kind of where that's the furnace that we're tapping into. Mm-hmm. But I also yeah. think when we're talking about low energy or low libido or these or people who tend to be kind of low functioning, I, I'm back in the kind of ego psychology world of of just kind of basic ego functioning. You know, so so that's sort of the ability to do what you say you're going to do. So if you have to um, call someone to come and help you, uh, you know, clean out your basement because it's full of junk, you know, can you do that? Can you get yourself to the basement and start going through it? Can you <laughs> go through the listings online to find someone to come help you? Can you make those phone calls? Can you? There, there is a part of it that's just like ego functioning. And, and sometimes people are not so good at that. You know, and and what is that, and how do we understand that? So, I I don't know that that this idea of kind of energy is under ego control or comes from the ego, but certainly in high functioning individuals, most of the time they are channeling their psychic energy effectively through the ego, so that goals can get met and things can get done. So I'm I'm wondering about kind of ego functioning, and I, I think we probably can all think of people that we have mm-hmm. in our life or have worked with who, who just don't seem to have that, and why not? Why do some people have it and some people don't? But Jung um, really talked about this when he was doing his word association tests, that um, when, so he's has a list of, what was it, 120 words or something like that, he has a list of words that were very, very common, and then he was timing how quickly people could find an association to a common word. So it might be tree, lumber, water, boat, um, dog, cat. <laughs> Obviously, I'm complex there, so <laughs> it took a little bit longer to get that next one. Um, and then he would notice that when there was an interruption in a normal flow of associations that something was interfering with the flow of energy towards a common object and out of that interruption of association he said well that must be a complex and normally there were life experiences or memories that somehow made the associations to that object Mm -hmm. complicated or diverted or uncomfortable so from the standpoint of ego functioning, we could say that when we think about a particular task, as you were saying, Lisa, if the flow of associations is interrupted by complexes, there isn't an easy, direct relationship to the thing that we right. are considering, which yeah. goes then to our work of where is the complex that's grabbing the energy mm-hmm. and and um, kind of sparking it over to the it's side, like siphoning it away, yeah. Yeah. siphoning it away. So one way to think of it, which goes back to the ego self axis, is you know I think of the ego self axis as sort of goes from the top of the head down, mm-hmm. um, as if it's a, a channel or or mm-hmm. a roadway where mm-hmm. energy can flow from consciousness to the unconscious, you know, and to the self, and it goes both ways, up and down, and that that channel can get blocked uh, Mm -hmm. through, you know, life events, unfortunate circumstances, um, you know, patterns of of difficulty, neglect, hardship, all kinds of things. So instead of having a nice open flow uh, where energy goes back and forth, um, things are blocked. Mm-hmm. And and that that's that's the complex. So that when somebody reads that word of of dog, the person goes, huh, um, cat. Uh, something is blocked. And I think as uh, as therapists, as analysts, of course, that is what we do. Uh, was, where is the energy blocked? Uh, let's let's see what's what we can find that is that is in the way that has to do with 
with history that has to do with experience and and memory. But I'm going to make a case that I think there are just differences between people because there are certainly oh. people who have horrendous <laughs> yes. life experiences and their channel doesn't get blocked. And I think there are also, I mean, I think there are people whose channel is blocked and then I just think there are different, we're all kind of probably born with different levels of of energy. We all just maybe are born mm -hmm. with a different size mm -hmm. gas tanks. I mean, Murray Stein <laughs> talks about this in Map of the Soul. He talks about um, Lyndon Johnson, who apparently was just had so much psychic energy and he just, he wrote copious letters every day. I mean, if you sort of look at that man's output, it's just how did one human being do that? Um, and then there are, you know, I mean, I, I can say that um, I have more energy than many people in my life and I drive them crazy because of it. <laughs> and I certainly know plenty of people with more life energy than I do, but I can see how I'm like, oh yeah, wait, let's do this too. Let's do that. Oh, could we do this? And people in my life are like head in hands, like Lisa, you have to stop. You're exhausting me. But but then I have people that you know I I have I have people in my extended family who are more that way than I do, and I'm like, well, 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 I just need to go back to bed. So I, I think we all just have different energy levels too and we have and we have a different ability maybe almost innately to to access the energy that's there or something i think we also have uh different kinds of energy yes of uh, the you know there's the lyndon johnson um energy or your mount kilimanjaro energy um <laughs> I, i'm not going on that trip by the way oh, okay. uh and, and and then there are people that have energy, let us say, you know, really for gardening, for working outside, uh, who have energy for re a reflective life, uh, who have energy for scholarly pursuits, which takes me back to what you were saying before, Lisa, about fantasy of what is one's inherent nature what was I really built for? And where is my natural source of energy? And that that discovery through having dreams, uh, fantasy, reflection and introspection uh, can put me, let's say, in touch with the right kind of energy directing it uh, in a way that is satisfying. That's the individuation process that is really at the core of, of Jungian theory, that to become the person that you were innately meant to be. Mm -hmm. you know. So we might imagine that every little acorn hits the ground going, whoa, I want to become an oak tree. But mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're not all acorns. We're all other kinds of potentials. And and the psyche will block energy if if we're forcing it to go down a channel that is really not uh, inherently suited to our essential nature. And this goes to the very difficult process of of discovering what we desire mm -hmm. rather than assigning right. what we mm -hmm. should desire. Exactly. Because you can't like something you don't like. Yes. Something that doesn't right. taste good will never really taste mm -hmm. good. Right. That we discover that we're attracted to a thing or a person, and you can't force it. So, again, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll hop on another short um, quote here um, from Jung. There are psychic goals that lie beyond the conscious goals. In fact, they may even be inimical to them. Mm. But we find that the unconscious has an inimical or ruthless bearing mm. toward the conscious only when the latter adopts a false or pretentious attitude. So the unconscious has its own goals. Mm -hmm. The conscious mind can have its independent goals. And if the unconscious mind is, or rather if the conscious mind is hostile, if the ego is hostile to the unconscious, the unconscious will just make your life really miserable. 
<laughs> and can cut off the power supply, cut off the uh, yeah. access to the electricity. So, so uh-huh. let's put this in the context of this kind of failure to launch phenomenon. And again, I, I know we've all seen this in our lives and in our practices. Let's say we've got a, uh, I don't know, let's say a young man who's approaching age 30, kind of still living in the proverbial basement. And maybe this person has intelligence and education, but but just hasn't, you know, maybe is either not working at all um, or is kind of under, really underemployed. Um, how do we, how do we understand this, this person's inability to, uh, to tune in and, and, and marshal this uh, life energy in pursuit of goals? And what, what can the person do about it? Well, I think that's the process really of, of exploration. And that's, that's where the work lies. But I'm thinking that we have an array here of possibilities that can be investigated and considered of, you know, is there some sort of difficulty with anxiety, depression, uh, some kind of a mood uh, disorder of some sort that is, that is interfering? Um, I have learned never, ever to underestimate physiology, uh, body chemistry, metabolism, <laughs> Uh, and it's worth considering, is there some sort of physiological health issue that could be contributing to this? Um, are there developmental blockages, which we just talked about as complexes, of stages of life where getting out in the world when you were just going to kindergarten or hitting junior high school that those uh, times of life of getting out and initiating were particularly difficult or marked by by some kind of of trauma. Uh, and uh, have there been um, constraints upon what's possible for you, either uh, just by uh, family considerations, socioeconomic considerations, external world uh, inhibitors that have prevented uh, accessing resources, accessing experiences, um, and opportunities for for personal growth. So I think those are some of the things to consider of, of reaching out and reaching into oneself for, hmm, what's up with me? Where is so, my energy? Yeah, so so a couple of things. First of all, um, I'm I'm thinking about uh, Jung talks variously throughout the collected works about the need to sort of sacrifice the bliss of childhood and yes. to get out into the world. And I think we're some. And here's a little quote about that: One must give up the retrospective longing, which only wants to resuscitate the torpid bliss and effortlessness of childhood. And in place of that, one has to cultivate a heroic attitude. Hmm. So that is part of the myth of the hero, is the hero is going to slay the dragon. Mm-hmm. And in, in kind of Neumann terms, that is to, to slay the enveloping, uh, kind of swallowing, uh, devouring mother that pulls us back into the world of childhood. And instead we have to develop this strong ego that can go out into the world. Um, but, but I want to say that um, we're also in this notion about the puer, you know, the, the eternal youth, kind of Peter Pan sort of syndrome kind of thing, you know, who, who wants to stay in this world where you don't have to really do anything. And if I mean, I think that this occurs probably most often in people who are from families with some means because often there's a little bit of something mm-hmm. that it allows them to remain, you know, they're, they're not, it's not like, hey, if you don't get a job, you're out on the street. It's like, you know, you know, mom or dad is going to give you a little money and you can stay in your basement. Um, so, so they're, they're, there is this way that it, you know it's, it's I don't want to cut the cord I don't want to venture out on my own I, I'm too overwhelmed 
Um, and I, I want to say I want to say something else about this because I, I think there's been a shift in the culture. When I was um, moving toward adulthood, I felt pretty much nothing but excitement. I was excited mm-hmm. to go to college. I was excited to figure out my career. I mean, I was I was scared too. I definitely remember being terrified. But I find that young people <laughs> on the cusp of adulthood now, right. there's something else going on. And I, I, I am, I'm sitting with this thought that there's a way that childhood now for many people is more magical and protected than it's ever been. You know, you know, um, kind of middle class kids in the United States, like everyone gets the trip to Disney, and mm. uh, there's, there's, you know, a, a, a birthday is always a special occasion, and and there, there's just so much emphasis on 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 the magic of childhood. And then childhood ends, and what have you got to look forward to? I mean, you're looking at your parents. They're stressed. They're bored. They hate their jobs. <laughs> you know, you're the best thing in their life. But you know, what is is that? Is that what we're doing here? You know, it's 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 a uh, it's really hard. I mean, I think that there are lots of young people now on the cusp of adulthood thinking this is not a good deal. I don't want to have to give up all that magic and wonder of childhood and just be faced with endless decades of dragging, hauling my ass to work every day to a job that I hate, you know? So there's, there's one other idea that I'll throw in here because I think it's in the neighborhood and then I'll, I'll mm. um, hand it over to you guys and see what you think, which is this, this theory about optimal stress. So this theory says that too little stress and you don't feel engaged, you're bored, essentially. Too much stress and you're overwhelmed. And I, I wonder if, if that relates to our topic that we're, we're not in the realm of optimal stress, that people feel actually overwhelmed and so they just kind of shut down. So I just threw a lot of stuff out there. I don't, I don't mm. know if any of that landed for either of you. You know where it took me is uh, to just reality, necessity, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and motive and motivation, and uh, that the proverbial uh, trust fund kids and uh, any financial advisor will tell you it's not a good idea. Uh, the tr- you know does not have to get out in the world, figure it out, uh, wrestle with themselves, and wrestle with a job. Uh, because there's a cushion there. Uh, you know, Jung says the world has always been a battleground. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it wasn't very long ago that if you didn't work, you didn't eat. And uh, so I think about motivation and necessity of, you know, sort of carrot and stick. And we've been talking about activating the carrot end in terms of fantasy, desire, um you know, one's inherent nature and going forward, like like you being excited, Lisa, to go to college. Yeah. Uh, but there's also stick of, um, okay, so you're anxious, you're scared, um, and we all have been. Uh, I was, I couldn't believe when I landed in college, sort of like, oh my gosh, now what? Uh, but there's that's the stick of do it, do it anyway of something that pushes us out into the world and that oftentimes we discover uh, when it's sink or swim that, by golly, we we can swim. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a a balance uh, there. I'm, I'm sitting with this question. I've certainly... I experienced myself as a young person mm-hmm. struggling to find my map, you know, find what I wanted, mm-hmm. and then thinking of of various analysands also. I, I guess I, I keep wanting to come back to this idea of fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, I, the, the fantasy that we start with is not necessarily the fantasy that we end with, mm. but that the fantasy is the thing that beckons, like the myth of Percival, you know, the glimpse of the grail. Right. It's, it's, it's something that carries enough libido that we're even paying attention to it. 
and then to get enough internal or external support to continue to relate to the fantasy, because the fantasy itself is a set of images that holds and discharges a quantity of energy, and it shapes the ego's relationship. So I think many people that are floating on their couches mm -hmm. or in their parents' basements, there is an interruption of fantasy. I think one of mm -hmm. the terrible interruptions of fantasy is being submerged in images that are generated by the collective. Uh. So for instance, if I'm spending 10 hours a day gaming, which is quite a reality for some people, I mean, that is a fantastical world, but mm -hmm. it's not a fantasy. Mm. Yes. But in the few times that I've played around with gaming, and I'm not, not very good at it, and it doesn't appeal mm -hmm. to me, but for about a week or so, I really tried to figure something out. I would close my eyes, and I would see those images still parading around yes. in my mind with oh, incredible that's... vividness. Mm -hmm. And they would started moving into my dream world mm -hmm. that it was so potent to focus on anything with that much of mm. an with immersive that yeah. dynamic, that much mm -hmm. energy. So I think that if I'm watching too much Netflix for that <laughs> matter, five, six hours a day, the way some people do, that there's a way in which our spontaneous and emergent production of images is replaced by but pornography for that matter. Mm -hmm. So images can come it's from really the outside in and colonize us mm -hmm, and yeah. take an awful lot of space. But we need to be able to track the images that come from the inside out. And of course that happens every night in dreams. <laughs> so sometimes just dream work very slowly can put people in touch with just self-generated imagery and to notice if they have any kind of an excitatory, energized reaction to anything in their dream life. But I am surprised when I ask people to talk about any fantasy about anything at all. Some people literally just grind to a halt. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they will begin weeping. Mm -hmm. They'll become irritated or, or worse. That just the invitation to open the door to whatever is on the move in there is, is really yeah. interfered with. And whether it's interfered with in terms of sharing it with another person, that's one interference, that they've been somehow convinced that whatever is in the treasure house mm. is a terrible thing. Yeah, they feel That they're not allowed to, <laughs> yes, tell anyone and if that goes deep enough, they're not allowed to know what it is they want. This can also be a, a symptom of narcissistic parenting, because if the child from very early on has been subtly and pervasively convinced that what they're interested in isn't really what they're interested in, what <laughs> you're really interested in is over here on stage right, because mommy and daddy are interested in that, there's a a constant but very consistent direction away from the child towards whatever that the parent or parents think mm -hmm. the child should or could be paying attention to mm -hmm. can create such a sense of alienation from that self-generating center that the self-generating the self-generating center becomes bizarre yeah. Mm. Frightening and threatening in as much as if one follows the self-generating place, then one now is alienated from the parental complexes which are associated with survival. So there's so many intricate ways that this can can go awry. And and when someone is alienated from fantasy then the promise of anything actually being gratifying is deeply violated. So if we come down to just Jung's ideas of instincts, which are generally connected to fantasy, he said, we have five, sometimes six instincts, <laughs> hunger, sexuality, 
creativity, activity, reflection, and then later in life he added religion, which is really just a self-created mythology. But all of those instincts are millions of years old, maybe even billions of years old, and they know what they want, at least on a <laughs> fundamental level. Yeah. Like when you're thirsty, you you want water at the very least. If you're hungry, you, you want food at the very least. But we can see, even even in modern culture, how much can interfere with mm -hmm. just the simplicity of yes. hunger and eat. Yeah. So you're really touching on uh, instinct here as something from which we are all too often separated uh, through all kinds of artificial stimuli of, of screens and video games and uh, other things that come in to us from the outside. And uh, you use the word simplicity, which I like a lot. And it made me think about how for eons, uh, people worked as shepherds or as farmers mm -hmm. and worked pretty well, uh, you know, alone going up and down the rows or, you know, out in the fields with the sheep. And that we were immersed in our bodies, our instincts. Uh, the earth and the rhythms of the earth, uh, there was a, a harmony uh, to our physical life and, and instinctual nature that has been artificially jacked up. And so, yes, you were talking about people who come in and don't, don't have access to fantasy, don't have access to their own interiority. Uh, because we've been overstimulated uh, with, with external world uh, ideas, uh, all kinds of stuff. But we have we ultimately whatever you do, you do with yourself. So if you don't have a self to do it with, uh, there's going to be a problem. As we have been interfered with. And, and I know yes. that there are also illnesses and that people have which make certain things difficult, but if we're looking at the average person who comes mm -hmm. in and there's a sense that their body is healthy enough yes. to have a reasonable level of functioning and that somehow is not happening, then the question is, where are, there, where are the instincts? And often they do show up in dreams, for instance, and we've spoken in other episodes, animals that seem injured or starving mm -hmm. or figures that are acting very strangely or eccentrically, that something has been misdirected or an instinct has been dramatically interfered with. Now, we're familiar with the sexual instinct because Freud created an entire system, so which is wonderful that when the sexual instinct is interfered with, he cataloged very meticulously all the mm. strange things that can happen in the psyche and even in the body if something just as basic as sexuality is thwarted, grossly thwarted. So Freud's done a great job with that. But things like creativity, activity, reflection, religion, and hunger, very little work has been done to that degree to say how do we become unwell for instance when creativity has been grossly interfered with the mm. capacity to create yeah mm -hmm. you know i'm thinking of this um young man that i know just in, in my personal life who is really extraordinarily bright and uh creative um, but he is having such a hard time kind of finding his way because he has really um, kind of crippling um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he is now receiving 
kind of cognitive behavioral treatment for that. And I think it's, mm -hmm. it's having some good effect. But the, the, the thing is that, you know, I, 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 I know him quite well. And, and I, uh, my diagnosis of the problem, and of course I could be wrong, but it goes to what you were just saying, Joseph, because he, he's a very soulful person and a deep thinker. Mm -hmm. And I think has a kind of strong spiritual capacity, but his upbringing and worldview is such that he cannot admit any of that. You know, he kind of laughs at me for being interested in dreams, for example. <laughs> and um, at one point, he did share a dream with me that he was living in a really narrow, very narrow, narrow house. Mm -hmm. mm. And, and to me, what I imagine is that I think this person has an expansive soul and needs a way to relate to the larger order of things, but he's shut that down. And so mm -hmm. it, it, um, it, it, that, so it, it kind of comes out through the, the obsessive compulsive behaviors. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, I might be wrong, but my fantasy is that if he would um, take up philosophy, for example, uh, or 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 really kind of you know get interested in you know the nature of the cosmos, or uh, you know read a lot of literary fiction, that some of the pressure that his psyche is under might be released a little bit. But I, I did want to say, you know, so what we've been talking about, you know, if you think your channel is blocked, mm -hmm. what are some things you can do? And uh, I, I don't pretend that this is an easy or quickly solved problem, but I do have some suggestions. <laughs> when I'm working with someone and I feel like that channel is blocked, here are some questions that I ask them. So uh, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times there's a very quick answer to that. Oh, I wanted to be an astronaut or something. But it's like, no, I mean, there was like what you told the adults, you know, but what, what did you imagine doing? What did you fantasize about doing mm -hmm. when you were a kid, you know? And, and oftentimes there's many things and they, they might be, you know, uh, sort of strange but if if we if we allow them to kind of take shape and take form you know we we could be curious about that and sort of see where there's a germ see if there's something back there that was there before the works got gummed up that we can find another question is what are you really good at like what are you the best at in the whole world of anyone you know <laughs> you're the one who makes the best tomato sauce Mm -hmm. Or you're the one who always knows where things are. Or it doesn't have to be like, I'm really good at, you know, winning law cases. It's, it doesn't have to be that grandiose. It could just be something small. It could be, mm -hmm. I'm really good at thinking up clever solutions to things. Mm -hmm. I'm really good at, I'm the one people call when something goes wrong and they need a listening ear. Or I'm really good at making people laugh. It's like, find that thing, that because often the thing that we're just really, really good at has some connection to our, our destiny and why we're here. And then the, the other thing, um, and I know we've talked about this before on the podcast, is I'll say to people, follow the energy. Like, mm -hmm. like me with my silly thing yesterday about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, it's like, you know, don't, when that happens, when you find yourself, you know, passing a storefront and you see like beautiful yarn and you're like, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll decide to knit. Like, don't just shut that down. I'm not saying you should run in and spend $200 on knitting supplies, but let that, let that live with you. Let yeah. that live with you. You know, imagine learning to knit and what would that be like? And, you know, uh, you know, is there a version of that you want to bring alive in your life or, 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 but even just before that, just mm -hmm. let yourself have the fantasy, notice it, 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 value it, value the fantasy and, and see what happens if you start doing that. And just as you go through your life day by day, where's the energy? What are the things we all have yeah. things we have to do? What are the things you want to do? What are they? Yeah. I often ask people to just notice what they like. Mm -hmm. And it's surprising that that um, goes by the boards a lot of the time. 
of, you know, I like going out to lunch. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like that first cup of coffee in the morning. Of, but to start literally noticing and take a little journal around with you. It could be small. It could be anything. But start paying attention of, of just noting down little random thoughts, a little notation. It says to Psyche, I am paying attention. I noticed that. You're starting to practice self-reflection. And, of course, we all do things that we don't necessarily like, but it follows along with what you were saying, Lisa, of, you know, where is my natural energy? Uh, where Where's the fantasy? What was this little spark of a crazy idea that I had while I was driving to the grocery store? Right. Of to develop a connection with your own interior. And my other thought is... Um, really seems uh, not to fit with a a sort of psychoanalytic orientation, but is just do something. Just do something. Mm -hmm. Have novelty. Break out of your pattern. Go for Do something different. Go somewhere. Go for a walk. Uh, It seems pretty silly. I mean, why would you drive downtown and walk around the park? Well, why not? Uh, It's like your analogy to walking by a knitting store and having an idea. It doesn't mean that you're going to spend the money on knitting supplies. But have some different experiences because oftentimes things from the external world uh, can find a niche in the internal world, can spark something. So change the channel, get out of a rut, uh, go for something that is novel and you see know, if you like it. Deb, that, that is really good advice because I, I think another thing, we didn't talk about this, but I think it's not unimportant. Another thing that can happen when we get in one of these low libido, low energy states is we're actually overwhelmed by our choices. Yes. And we have a fantasy that there is one correct choice. And so mm-hmm. we feel paralyzed. So we could, we could, you know, go to this graduate program or that graduate program, or do we want to study this or do we want to study that? Or should we take this job or that job? And sometimes the choice just feels too momentous. And and so we kind of do nothing. And I think your advice is, you know, just do something. I mean, honestly, when yeah. you're stuck, just do something, make one move and don't worry too much about whether it's a move in the wrong direction. I mean, it's, you know, as long as it's you know fairly low stakes, I wouldn't say, okay, I'm going to commit to this, you know, four hundred thousand dollar graduate program. No, maybe not that, but you know, do something. <laughs> Just uh, you know, do something and and do something maybe you haven't done before. You know, right. I mean, there's there's a kind of exhortation to sort of try something that's a little challenging every day. You know, do one one thing that's a little scary or difficult that you haven't done before. And and I think I think that's a good practice. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of a an interesting uh, parameter that some people are writing on um, the tension between maximizing an experience versus satisficing an mm-hmm. experience. <laughs> and what they're finding is that because of the multiple options that we have, and perhaps the great capacity that people have in the marketplace now to get the best, only the best, or the, or the greatest, or the most gratifying, that if we're looking at having only the best, just the right thing, that that's um, correlated with depression, mm. um, paralysis, mm. this inability to take action. What they find is that if people develop a criteria of satisficing <laughs> that you know i'm going to do an an activity that's just satisficing that is a it's ghastly the, word i just I know, have to it? it a, <laughs> it's they i didn't make it up um and what they wanted to do was somehow step outside of satisfying but um yeah what's an activity that would just be satisficing well maybe maybe that would be enough to just Take a walk yeah. around the block. It doesn't have to be maximizing mm-hmm. everything. That's interesting. That's really interesting. So just a little bit of creativity, a little bit of self-reflection, just what basic body need have mm-hmm. have I 
not touched on right. that would just be satisficing. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can't give myself a shower, but what if I stuck my head under the kitchen sink and just cleaned my hair with some nice warm water? That sounds odd, but for some people, that's kind of what they can get to if they don't even have the energy to shower. But it's remarkable how good that feels right. if you can't get the other stuff going. Mm -hmm. So just a little bit of satisfaction in any of these areas can be enough mm -hmm. to let a little quantity of energy free up. Mm -hmm. And if that becomes available in the system, then other more dynamic images can gain some energy and we can find ourselves willing or capable of taking another larger, more dynamic step. So just as you were saying, Deb, any activity, if we know that we're looking for action, any bit of creativity, mm -hmm. any bit of sexuality, which could be something just pleasurable, as pleasurable as just running your fingers up and down the inside of your arm to give you a sense like, oh, that feels good. That's a nice feeling. I haven't mm. thought about that feeling nice for a long time. Um, and self-reflecting is just sitting there and talking to yourself. Mm -hmm. The religious function, I think, has to do just with indulging the mythic world, which for some people might just be reading Rumi's poems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't have to make a big commitment mm -hmm. to the religion of our childhood to be brushing against some kind of a cosmology, some kind of a fantasy about something that's greater than us. But again, I think what we're all saying is just a little taste of mm -hmm. something that tastes good mm -hmm. can be enough to just point the compass in a direction and create a little spark, mm -hmm. a little bit of vitality. And that builds up over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we should uh, switch to a dream. And before we do, I just am going to plug Dream School. So we talked this episode a lot about how tuning into your dreams can be a way to get you unstuck. And uh, Dream School is a tool that can help you tune in, can help you. Uh, we have help in there for recalling your dreams, recording your dreams, and then understanding the messages that come. So dreams are one of the principal ways that I look to when I'm working with someone who's very stuck. You know, I'll say, bring in the dreams. Let's figure out what your psyche, what your soul needs you to do. And Dream School will give you the tools to uh, learn how to do that. Um, so we have a sort of special dream today because this dreamer um, submitted dream a dream back when the podcast was fairly new, and we uh, analyzed one of her dreams for her. It was in 2018. And then she submitted this dream recently, and uh, the dream references our interpretation. So we thought it, would, it was a great example. There's some common imagery. It's a wonderful example to look at these two very beautiful, complex dreams and uh, kind of contrast them and kind of see the shifts in her psyche. So I think I will start by reading the original dream. Um, and this dreamer is, um, I don't have her age then. Let me just see how old she is now. So she's 50 now, and this would have been about five years ago, I guess, that we did her first dream. So here's the first dream. I'm in a bathhouse, a Turkish bath, and I'm sitting immersed in a pool of warm water to my waist. I'm sitting with my back to a rectangle column made out of black granite. I have my arms stretched like a crucifix, and my hands are holding onto the column that is behind me. The pool is made of green granite. To my left, there is an altar made out of cubic-shaped granite, 
and on it sits a woman who is a sage, a seer, a fortune teller, or a magician. She is wearing a long dress and is sitting cross-legged. My back is hot and dries the film of water on the column. And as the column dries, my back leaves marks on the column. The marks are magical symbols. They resemble the Japanese Zen art that is done by a water wet brush on a black rock. And it fades, it, excuse me, it fades as the water dries. The woman comes and looks at these marks and she is flabbergasted. She says she has never seen magical marks such as these. In the bottom of the pool and in front of me, there is a piece of green granite with a circular metal inlay and a ring attached to the circular metal. It resembles the remains of a counterweight that would have been used in, the op in opening the gates to a castle. I look at it and with the power of my mere stare, the rock floats up to the surface of the water and glides on the surface. Then the rock starts skipping on the surface of the water three times and lands on the skirt of the woman who is back on the altar. And let's take a minute and listen to what the three of us <laughs> said about this dream back in 2018. <laughs> the first thing I can feel is that it's a very complicated dream and it would take a lot of work, maybe over even weeks or months, to really unpack and, and metabolize mm -hmm. the various components of it. But if we start at the beginning with the image of a person immersed in a pool of warm water, the first feeling that I have is this relaxing down in consciousness, that abaissement mm -hmm. that Jung talked about, that, that the ego needs to relax down into the, the fluid of the unconscious to begin to catch glimpses of you know the things that are on the move in the deep. And I'm thinking about the alchemical image of people in the bath and the alchemical process of salutio where old complexes and so on can dissolve, old ego structures, etc. can kind of melt into the water. The feeling tone uh, seems like it's safe and uh, a Turkish bath. It's all very acculturated, right? Of People would go to bathhouses and it would be warm water. And yeah, it seems like this dreamer has you know, sort of specific associations with that from her. Versus, let's say, um, being out in the ocean. Mm -hmm. But here there's there's a lot of structure, especially a lot of granite. Yeah, and it's black and green. Mm -hmm. Does the black and green kind of speak to you? I'm just noticing it. I don't I don't have mm -hmm. a particular um an immediate association, no. yeah. I'm I'm feeling myself moving into the stream kind of slowly. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's part of that kind of sinking in that you talked about, Joseph. Mm -hmm. Well, it's definitely in, inviting us in. I think about the kind of guided meditations that mm -hmm. some people do at workshops. And this almost sounds like something you could uh, induct somebody mm -hmm. down into to have a certain kind of encounter. Some of the things I just want to land to is stepping away a little bit from the narrative and just looking at the sequence of some of the images. So we're sinking down in the water. Then she's in a crucifixion position. Then there's a woman sitting on a cube. So I'm thinking a little bit about what does it mean for an analysand, for any of us, to have a moment of crucifixion, to have the hands you know, pinned or extended right and left. Her arms are stretched out, and she's holding the column. So that's different than being nailed to a cross. There's a decision involved in this. Even if we were to adopt the position right now and we reach out to the right and left, there's this decision to hold a certain amount of tension mm -hmm. and to conduct or be a conductor for a tension between two things or several things. So there's some agency in the dreamer's mind, which is reflected perhaps in their comments, the context, that they have been doing work Mm -hmm. And they have been very active in this work. The next image of the woman sitting on the cube is an archetypal image um, from the tarot series, tarot yeah, cards, and the high too. priestess. 
which is the second tarot card in the sequence. And often what we'll see are uh, as a female figure sitting on a cube between two uh, pillars, which are thought to be the pillars of Solomon, white and black. And as she sits holding a scroll, which is often a symbol of the Torah and has symbols on it, uh, Hebrew letters, perhaps not unlike the symbols that the woman's back is leaving as the water dries, which are the laws of the universe and also the secret recordings of the unconscious. And one interpretation or several images of the high priestess has her robe as it cascades to her feet, turning into water. Mm. And it is an idea that the watery substance of the unconscious is an extension of this primal feminine. Mm-hmm. And she's, you know, having an encounter in the dream with the substance of the unconscious itself. Yeah, and that's sort of, I think that the themes that you're lifting up there, you can also see that in the, in the fact that these magical symbols, apparently of great potency, you know, that the, the sage is flabbergasted at them. They're left by the dreamer's back. And so this is something that's happening sort of behind us, like outside of consciousness, you know, but the, there's something really potent there that's moving in the unconscious. It reminds me also of some of the images that are familiar in Kundalini Yoga, where you'll have um, an image of the sage, and then coming up the spine of the sage, there will be a Sanskrit words or letters, mm, which are inscribed uh, on the images of the chakras, or these ideas of energy centers, ascending and, and intricate kind of dialogues. Hmm, That's that's an interesting amplification. Just going back for one second to the crucifix, Joseph, which you did a really good job with, and to say that we often understand the image of the crucifix as holding the tension of the opposites. Mm -hmm. You know, and as you point out, it is done voluntarily. Mm -hmm. She's not nailed there, but there is a kind of willingness to submit to this betwixt and between place and to hold that. I'm aware that I feel very hesitant about saying anything much about this dream, Mm -hmm. given the dreamer's uh, history and all all these very magical and it seems to me very promising uh, symbols in the dream. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm kind of reluctant to deconstruct it in a way or or make meaning out of it. I'm interested in the shadow figure of uh, this woman who is the sage, a seer, a fortune teller, or a magician. And what this sage, seer, fortune teller may be a, a healing kind of compensatory image that the psyche has generated uh, be, because the dreamer, dream ego, really needs this Uh, And the symbols are in the back and those water paintings, I've seen them where you have a special board and you can make some kind of a drawing with a wet paintbrush. And as the water evaporates, the image fades. So it may imply that there are some things that are not in consciousness, but maybe are coming into being. I can understand your your caution, Deb, that when somebody brings a dream that is full of very archetypal Mm -hmm. images, Mm -hmm. As analysts, we often have a sense that there's a lot of power in the psyche, um, there's a lot of energy, and that we don't want people to become overwhelmed or we, um, well, as and, they're and also managing this, it. This, you want to treat it reverently. Yes, I exactly. Think. So you, you want to be careful not to manhandle it. And, you know, there's also sometimes, and I don't get the sense this is true of this dreamer, but it's hard to say for sure. Sometimes these big archetypal dreams are kind of a defense. <laughs> you know, it's sort of a, a kind of um, spiritual bypass sort of phenomenon. Right. So sometimes a person could be really facing a very concrete suffering in their lives, and they'll kind of ascend to a very spiritual or a very philosophic attitude to cope with it for a while. Sometimes that really helps them get through a rough spot. And then at another time in their life, they'll have to reland on mm-hmm. what happened when perhaps it feels safer to really experience the feeling. But I think something that's encouraging, Deb, based on your respect for the dream, is the idea that an enormous counterweight 
has constellated in the second half of the dream. So she talks about this big metal circle, which is linked into the granite with a ring on it. And if we think about it as a counterweight, uh, just like a counterweighted window. So these old windows were extremely heavy. So they would run a rope from the bottom window up along the sides and down into the casing of the wall. And inside the wall, there would be a very heavy lead weight. So the window would be balanced and it would just take a little bit of energy to lift the window Mm. up when it would normally be too heavy for somebody to move. So here we have a counterweight, which would be used to create some ease in lifting the impossibly heavy castle door. Mm, okay. But right now it's floating, so it can't really do its job. It's, yeah. it's not supposed to be floating. Mm. It's supposed to be as heavy as a castle door. But her magical power in the dream prevents it from actually being as weighty as it would need to be to be effective. So this goes a little to your idea yeah. about whether or not it's difficult at the moment to allow the counterbalancing weightiness to to land, but its potential is there. Yeah, and it skips on the surface. Mm-hmm. So there yes. may be a way that there is some deep content here that can only can only skim across the surface of it for now. Mm-hmm. And land in uh the lap of the uh of the shadow figure, the yeah. woman who's back on the altar. So it's something needs to be spiritualized, perhaps. Uh, for now. But there is someone to hold it. There is an energy in the psyche that can hold it. Yes. The other thing that is floating through the dream very lightly at the moment, between the image of the uh, crucifix and the word altar being used several times, Mm -hmm. and altars were often places of sacrifice, as well as places where objects of veneration could be placed. So there is this theme of sacrifice. It's like an implication that something might need to be sacrificed. Yes. And again, this is all just our speculation, but perhaps there is an excessive spiritualization, an airiness that might have to be sacrificed in order for the weightiness, the counterweight to be fully land, which would then could be used to open a door that mm-hmm. could not be yeah. opened mm-hmm. otherwise mm-hmm. in the psyche. Yeah, I think that's it. I think so too. Thank you to the dreamer for sharing this and uh, we're thinking about you. Okay, so let's, let's see about the new dream. Uh, so um, as I mentioned, this is a 50 year old woman. She works as a judge. She titled this dream Silvery Lake. So this is the new dream. I am sitting cross-legged in meditation. I'm sitting against the outside wall of of an old Swiss-German building with white walls and exposed brown beams. Above my head, there is a narrow porch on the second floor of this building, and it is giving me shelter. The porch is also made from dark brown wood, similar to the exposed beams. In front of me, there is a vast lake that is silvery color under the beautiful moonlight. As I meditate, the moon goes through phases. It is a crescent and then becomes full. I am not sure how long I am here, but when the moon becomes full, there is a high tide and the water rises so that it comes all the way to me. I am submerged in this water up to my waist, and I continue meditating. The water is surprisingly warm and is exactly the same temperature as my body, so I don't feel it at all. At this point in the dream, I remember a dream from four to five years ago where I was in a magnificent Roman Persian bath. This submergence in the high tide reminds me of that dream. And I even remember the interpretation that this union life had of that dream. I continue my meditation and slowly the lake water recedes. And to my amazement, I am completely dry. The tide is over. I know that I now need to get up and go and lead my journalist and lawyer friends. I get up and go. Now I'm in the old library building. It reminds me of Trinity College Library. 
I can see the ceiling curved or arched beam. I can also see the beams under the floor, which is unusual. The beam below the floor mirrors the beams over the ceiling, and as though I have laser eyes, I can see inside the building structure. This is the place we work, or I am coming to meet my collaborators. I have a file of paper under one arm as I walk along this room. And so here's the context. She says, the dream you interpreted in 2018 was remarkably significant. It unfolded over four years of my life as I became very involved with Zen practice. I know this dream is saying something similar and has similar significance. It even made a reference to the bath dream you interpreted. This year, I have begun some collaboration with fellow Iranians who are journalists and lawyers, and we are focusing on environmental issues and justice. I recently came back from a Zen yoga teacher training with the same Zen master. My perspective in life has drastically changed over the past year as I embarked on a number of Zen practice retreats with high intensity. I am still in analysis and have been for eight years. Life is at its most peaceful and happy, uh, while not much has changed outwardly. And in terms of feelings in the dream, she says, um, calmness, resolve, happiness. The silvery lake and moonlight was beautiful. I do think there is something about the Swiss architecture and the lake, perhaps a Jungian reference or Lake Zurich, not sure. I have always wished to see Trinity College Library. And uh, in terms of association, she says, the moonlight and the silver colors of the lake and the moon are contrasted with the warm glow in the old library and the warm wooden walls and floors, which were very earthy. Being washed by the lake water without feeling cold or wet was amazingly pleasant. Okay. Mm. So I'll just start um, by pointing out these, these themes. So there's sitting cross-legged. There's obviously being in water up to her waist. Mm -hmm. There is, um, she mentions in the first stream that the, the, the column is wet, and then as it dries, these marks are left. In the second dream, she notes that it's the, the thing she's leaning against, I think, is dry. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of kind of strong spiritual imagery in both dreams. Interestingly, one of the things that's really different is there is no sage, magician, fortune teller figure. Yeah. It strikes me that this uh, dream that you just read uh, has a real internal consistency that the dream from four or five years ago didn't have. Uh, we have in the dream from 2018, uh, there is this uh, sage, magical woman, a fortune teller or magician, uh, magical symbols, and then in the second half of the first dream, uh, the counterweight does not act as it should. Mm -hmm. uh, she says the counterweight uh, moves just from the power of her stare that floats up to the surface of the water and glides on the surface and starts uh, skipping and landing on the skirt of the sage. So... Uh, th this is a sort of magical uh, kind kind of uh, occurrence in the dream that does not comport with what we sometimes call the real life test of mm -hmm. what would happen in real life. Well, a counterweight uh, should have weight because its weight is what helps you lift, let's say, the castle door. Mm -hmm. uh, the weight is needed. Now, this dream, um, everything is really much more consistent. She's, she's meditating. There's water. There's moonlight. The moon goes through phases. High tide. She continues meditating. Um, she's in sync with the water temperature, which is 
the same as her body temperature, and, and then it recedes. And then she says, I now need to get up and go and lead my journalist and lawyer friends. I get up and go. So I'm really noting that after this experience in the dream, she engages in uh, a real activity. Uh, she's hmm. going to en engage with, yeah. with, co with colleagues, lawyer, uh, and do something in the world. So mm -hmm. the hint of escapism that I might think of in the first dream is is absent uh, in in this dream. Yeah, just to just to be to, uh, tip our hand here, we have not re-listened to our interpretation of the earlier mm -hmm. dream, but I remember that Joseph, you picked up on the the counterweight and. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if we use this term, but it's basically kind of an image of a sort of spiritual bypass. You know, it's like, it's all kind of magical and great, but something's not, doesn't have the gravitas it should. And I agree with yeah. you, Deb. Yeah. This dream yeah. hits really differently. The other important thing is, um, obviously, this moon that goes through phases, and yeah. there's this kind of tide that rises and falls with it which really conjures up this image of uh, a kind of process that just needs to take a certain amount of time. It's very similar, actually, to the imagery in the fairy tale, The Nixie of the Mill Pond, where um, this, uh, uh, um, yeah, this woman is trying to rescue her lover, I think. And uh, she goes to the mill pond, and, and at one point it's just his head that's above the water, and then she has to come back. And she may, I think it, she has to come back at the full moon, if I'm not mistaken. The next time she comes back, more of him is revealed, and then finally enough of him is revealed that she can rescue him. I might have some of those details uh, m mixed up, but it's that idea. So it's, it's this idea of a, a, a sort of developmental sequence over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really portrayed beautifully in this dream. I'm going to uh, pull up an image, which we don't you normally do on the podcast, but I think okay. it would be interesting. Hmm. I'm hoping this is uh, coming across. This is the uh, hierarchy number 18, the moon. Can you guys see that? Is it coming across? Yeah, I can see it. I don't know, I don't know if uh, people on YouTube will be able to see it, and certainly our podcast listeners won't, Je Joseph. So why don't you just describe it for a minute? And I will. Um, so the 18th tarot uh, card in the sequence of the Major Arcana is called the Moon. And it depicts um, a pool of water in the front and a golden path that leads up various hills up to a violet mountain. From the water there is a violet crayfish that mm. passes by rocks and vegetation, passes by a wolf, and then a dog from grassy fields to plowed fields and between two towers clearly built by human beings, and above it is, is a moon that is in various phases, but the power of the moon. So when, when we were listening to the dream, I was thinking of the magnetic power of the moon to draw. And so in the dream, it seems to be drawing the tide. Hmm. And that as the water or the tide continues to rise as she's meditating, that the water meets her and it is the same as her body temperature. So I'll just stop at that point. So in Tarot Key 18, what it's depicting is the magnetic draw of evolution. Hmm. That from the primordial waters, these um, crustaceans are drawn forward in some way that is remarkable, uh, becoming wolves and then wolves hmm. refine and through human intervention into dogs and and then mammals evolve into human beings. And there is a promise that life is continuing 
to be drawn forward in this evolutionary process to the next stage and the next stage. And the fact that this somehow is related to her being in a meditative state, what that suggests is that meditation for her is in some way facilitating an evolutionary process, mm. which many of the yogic traditions claim to be true. Now, in yogic traditions, there is an idea that meditation actually draws a substance up from the base of the spine, called the kundalini, which just means the serpent force, that there's some kind of a vitality in the body that is released and rushes forward and facilitates the activation of unconscious material and the activation of those latent images puts pressure on the ego to develop. So many people that practice both meditation and kundalini yoga often go through periods of great intensity because mm -hmm. material has been activated and now demands accommodation. But there is a, a path of evolution that is intrinsic to human beings, which Jung talks about in terms of telos, that there is a way forward. We might traverse that path slowly, but sometimes if we avail ourselves of a kind of dynamism, we might be able to make that happen faster, almost in the same way that putting a tomato plant in a hothouse mm -hmm. makes it grow under um, extraordinary conditions so things come to fruit more dynamically because it's enhanced. So she's in a process where something magnetic, something much larger than herself, the full moon, mm -hmm. is drawing a tide. And because I live at the coast, a full moon can pull the ocean or the bay feet, dozens of feet higher onto the shore. And if there's um, a wind or a storm, it can mm -hmm. really move enormous amounts of energy. And that seems to be happening. The other thing which I find very important is the idea that the water is the same temperature as her body. Mm. That seems very, very important. And there's two associations. One is with amniotic fluid, and that's uh, really like a cellular memory of returning to a primal gestating place. But interestingly, the alchemists also said that their furnace, or the Athenor, where remarkable transformations would occur later in life, must be kept at a warm, moist, equable heat. And equable means a kind of homeostasis. And what the metaphor is that it too is the human body. That the second alchemical birth happens in the regulating heat of your own body, facilitated by this meditational evolution. So I have a sense that she is in a very substantive process. And the last image where this is leading, which I just thought was absolutely remarkable, mm -hmm. she's granted a kind of magical power that she now has X-ray mm -hmm. eyes, laser beam eyes, which means that she now can see underneath the surface of things which some people might say is a symbolic attitude, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. understanding metaphor. Some people quite literally develop a spiritual sensitivity that their intuition is so remarkably attuned that they are able to see patterns and sense things that are happening in the soul and even in the community before they emerge into the conscious life. And what she sees is that that which is below is mm -hmm. as that which is above, and that which is above is as that which is below, which is one of the hermetic ideas and part of the 
tablet of Hermes Trismegistus mm -hmm. and is said to be this recognition of spiritual continuity. Mm -hmm. Another way, which was related to our earlier um, podcast, and you were saying this, Lisa, that there is a demand that the inside and the outside of our personality become congruent and that we might become unwell. And this goes to the Gospel of Thomas, that if you bring forth what is in you, it has a medicinal value, but if you don't bring forward what is in you, that it will hurt you, that it can become poisonous. So I, I find this to be just a remarkable um, spiritual dream. And how wonderful that towards the end that sh she is meeting her collaborators. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the inner collaborators could be all of these wonderful inner capacities, inner figures, the self, the functional complexes, all of her creative capacities, as well as having outer correlates, really finding a community of people that are deeply supporting her in this evolution that she is facilitating through her mm -hmm. own efforts, through her own discipline, and her commitment to align with those magnetic forces that are drawing all life slowly or quickly forward in an evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, well, those are my, some of my fantasies about yeah, this. Those are great. Uh, this is um, an unusual dream, you know, uh, building on what you've just said, Joseph. This is a very affirming and confirming dream. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, our, our dreams offer some sort of a corrective. Uh, it might be a really contradictory position where the dream maker is saying, nope, you know, I see this totally differently. It might be uh, some difference. Um, yeah, I agree with this part, but the dream maker says, I see this part a little differently. It's unusual when uh, a dream is as unambiguously affirming as this. And it really seems to hark uh, to the work that this dreamer has been doing in her spiritual and meditative practice uh, since that first dream she offered us in, in 2018. You know, Deb, it's true that dreams are not often confirmatory, but I do find that if, if, if you're in a long-term depth process, you have more confirmatory dreams. Yeah. And, you know, if you've been working with your dreams for a while, your, your, your earlier dreams are like, no, you're not getting it. No, you got to do more of this, less of that. But then eventually you sort yeah. of sync up with the self and the dreams are like, good job, good job. Pay attention yeah. to this, but overall yeah. you're doing good. And, uh, you know, and, and it's interesting because if you look at the, the resolution of both of these dreams, I mean, there, there isn't a strong resolution in either, but the first one, it's really open-ended, right? It's like the, the counterweight just lands on the skirt or whatever of the seer. And so it's a sort of like just, we are just left in the middle of the story. But Deb, as you pointed out, and I think this is just so important for this dream, you really put your finger on it. She has this process in the Silvery Lake. And then she moves into the library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So something is happening. Either she's meeting inner collaborators or she's moving out into the world, maybe both. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the library is a much earthier place. You know, it's, there's a sort of dark earth, earth toned wood than the silvery lake. So we've left the realm of the spiritual, but we've been able to carry that gift into this different environment. And it's a library. Yeah. It's, a, it's a special library. Uh, so it's a place of wisdom and learning. And she can now kind of access that. So, so I think that um, in terms of, you know, we should talk sometime on the podcast. I would like to talk about a dream series. This is a series of two but it does show you how dreams are like a little x-ray into your psychic development to even just mm -hmm. compare and contrast these two dreams. 
And uh, Joseph, I loved what you said about the water and um, her relationship with the water is really different in these two dreams. For one, mm -hmm. the first dream, it's a bath. It's a gorgeous bath, but it's a bath. This is a vast right. lake. <laughs> and, uh, and also she has this wonderfully pleasurable experience. I love that you brought up amniotic fluid. That's just really brilliant. I also thought of the alchemical aqua permanence or the divine water. Mm -hmm that she's mm -hmm. somehow bathing in too. So really, really, really lovely. And uh, thank you so much to the streamer for coming back to us with this dream. Uh, I, I'm so turned on by the dream. I just want to say a few more things. Oh, absolutely. The water, the water that does not wet the hand. Yes. Is mercury. And of course, oh. if any of you have seen liquid mercury, Damn, yes. it's that strange substance it's it's a metal but it actually doesn't saturate anything and when something is surrounded by mercury and then heated up it acts as the great solvent and often yeah, yeah. in alchemical work an ore would be crushed it would be put in a vessel the mercury would be boiled with it and then the mercury would um, take the gold separate it out and then the mercury would vaporize and then go into a cooling coil, and then the gold would be left coating the surface, the inside surface of the vessel. So mercury don't is try the this at universal... Home. Don't try this at home, because <laughs> they'll make you very unwell. Mercury is dangerous. <laughs> but um, but it, in the ancient world, they thought the mercury had created the gold and then would, would then exit the chemical reaction mm -hmm. unchanged and ever pure. So to be in and out of the silvery liquid that's great. that's great that leaves you dry is very much like the transformative mercury. And and the divine water, the aqua permanence, is contained in the vase hermeticum in in the yes, in Mercury's exactly. base. And of course Mercury is um Hermes, their their equivalents. Exactly. So that's so, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Right. So and I I would just love to read the Emerald term, uh, Emerald yeah. Tablet of Hermes mm -hmm. before we finish, because I think it's Absolutely. like in the space. Deb, you want to say something? Yeah, you know, I'm just noticing uh, the feeling tone uh, among the three of us, <laughs> and for <laughs> and for this dream, which the dreamer says that the feelings in the dream were uh, calmness and satisfaction and happiness, and uh, if there's been a contagion effect that mm -hmm. we're all resonating to what a wonderful dream. Yes. What a confirming, affirming dream, and that there's more and more and more uh, something has come toward her mm -hmm. uh, and given her this very special dream. And, and Joseph, I want to I wanna let you say what you're going to say, but I'll, I'll just say that yeah. I've had the pleasure of getting to know the streamer just a little bit because uh, we've, commu we've corresponded about, about the first dream. Because anyway, mm -hmm. And I know that um, the time of the first dream, she was, uh, there was some very difficult material. And I, I'm just really tickled to hear her say that life is sort of as good as yeah. it's ever been. Um, but, but anyway, so, you know, even without knowing that, though, we, we came to understand that by, by the images in the dream. And I can just confirm it because yeah. I, I know her just, just a tiny little bit. But Joseph, what were you going to say? All right. Well, oh, and also, so wonderfully, <laughs> as she goes into this transformative water, she comes out. And then she goes into life yes, because she is going yes. to then lead her fellow lawyers yes, and journalists, right. which is much that process of illumination mm -hmm. that somebody is transformed, yeah. but then has a kind of duty to the world at large, yes. which is so fantastic. And you'll hear that in the uh, Emerald Tablet of Hermes, because as far as the energy ascends, it then descends back down to earth. <clears throat> true, without falsehood and certain and most true, that which is above is as that which is below, and that which is below is as that which is above for the performance of the miracles of the one thing. And as all things are from one, 
by the mediation of one, so all things have their birth from this one thing by adaptation. The sun is its father, the moon its mother, the wind carries it in its belly, mm. its nurse is the earth. This is the father of all perfection or consummation of the whole world. Its power is integrating if it be turned into earth. Thou shalt separate the earth from the fire, the subtle from the gross, suavely and with great ingenuity. It ascends from earth to heaven and descends again to earth and receives the power of the superiors and of the inferiors. So thou hast the glory of the whole world, mm -hmm. therefore let all obscurity flee before thee. This is the strong force of all forces, overcoming every subtle and penetrating every solid thing. So the world was created, hence were all wonderful adaptations of which this is the manner. Therefore am I called Hermes, Trismegistus, having the three parts of the philosophy of the whole world. What I have to tell is completed concerning the operation of the sun. Well... And with so that? people spend their whole lives <laughs> unpacking that. But yeah, yeah. There's That's much amazing. in this dream which lends to that. Yeah, there is. What a, what a beautiful dream. We hope you've enjoyed our extended discussion of it. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.